Hello everyone and welcome to our third and final lecture in chapter 12 as well as our final lecture in our unit on the judicial branch. In this lecture we're going to take a look at some of the influencing court decisions that have been made by our Supreme Court. All right so let's get into it. All right so the decisions of the court. Now these there's five things that you need to consider when our our Supreme Court actually makes the decision um, or they they consider. One are the existing laws you have to also think about the personal views of the justices themselves. Even though they're supposed to interpret the law, those personal views can come into it. You have to think about the interactions that are there between the justices and themselves with each other, as well as social forces and public attitude. And that's probably the most important um, that can kind of influence or be an outside influence, as well as the role the Congress and president play in the decisions of the court. All right, so basing the decisions, remember the law is the foundation and justices are supposed to be unbiased. Their decisions have to be on the principles of the law. But as we know, that's not always the case, but they do try as much as possible to be as unbiased. Okay, now there's unclear meanings of laws which can create difficult decisions or just the ideas of the interpretation of the laws. So how you interpret the constitution can mean that it's difficult to actually make a determination or understand the limits on what's there. And that's why there's these legal questions. It's why these are very, very important um, cases. Or like when we, we, we take a look at a few moving forward, they're dealing with substantial federal questions that they're taking a look at. Now, the justice's job are these three things. They have to interpret the language of the law. From there, after interpreting it, you want them to determine the meaning. And then three, they have to apply the circumstances to the actual case. So how does that law apply to the case? And the interpretations can only relate logically to the Constitution and the Constitution only. They can't bring outside stuff in. Now, the views. Um, active interest in the cases import is important in the issues that the, case, that the Supreme Court has to like, take a look at. Now... Differing opinions are, are possible. You know, you might have some people that are looking at, look, hey, we need to protect individual right, rights versus crime rights or have a different viewpoint altogether on something that's not necessarily there. And that's okay. You want the differing of opinions there. It's part of the discussion. It's part of deciding the legal um, questions that the Supreme Court's taking a look at. Now, there are consistent p positions in areas of personal concern because we all have our personal feelings, whether it's liberal versus conservative and so forth. And what this actually can do is it can lead to voting blocks where you actually have coalitions of justices, which can be a benefit. It can also be a problem, especially when you're seeing that it's more split versus by liberal or conservative views or party views um, that can cause a problem, but it also can be a benefit. Now, when you have non-aligned justices, whether it's on just a particular issue or whether one's not necessarily conservative or liberal or whatever, they can be what we call a swing vote. And this is important in other areas too, but they can be the deciding vote in switching something from like a 4-4 tie to a 5-4, you know, decision or what have you. Now the relations of our Supreme Court, um, you need to understand this too. So in the early years, our justices only lived part-time in Washington, D.C. We actually didn't have um, a Supreme Court building until 1935. Now our Supreme Court, they live in D.C. year round, just like we see within the legislative branch and, and so forth, that they're pretty much, it's a full-time job. Same thing here. It's a full-time job for them. They're living there year round. But even though we have these nine justices and they're supposed to work together, for really all intents and purposes, they are operating as nine independent law firms, and most of their communications done in writing um, or email um, or over the phone um, because they have so much work. And, you know, you typically see the courts themselves, we don't really hear much from them. You don't want to hear much from the courts because if you do, that would actually undermine their integrity, and you don't want to see courts in open conflict. And they they avoid open conflict for that reason. If the integrity is gone of the Supreme Court ruling, then nobody's going to follow it. Because remember, they don't have enforcement power. Now, as always, the more harmonious the court, the better they get to get, get along together, as well as, you know, really anything. If people get along together, you're going to have easier time working together, common solutions, even if you have people that are varying different, different decisions. Now, 
this also can help if you have a strong chief justice. Um, the chief's influence can help direct not only discussion and set up the, the, the dis, um, you know, their work and make it more efficient, but they can work better with others. And they assign the writing of opinions. And that is a very important thing because remember, if you're, let's say it's an important case and the chief justice is like, no, I want you, one of the associate justices, to write the main opinion for this, that's influential because that person's name is going to be linked to that case. And that can help work, help with the relationships of, of everybody across um, uh, the Supreme Court. It also can hurt, too. You know, you might somebody might feel slighted because, remember, they're people, too. All right. So now, um, court and society. So public support and social forces are also a driving uh, force behind a lot of the things that go along with the Supreme Court. More indirectly, um on an everyday basis, but they can be more direct depending on what's going on and depending on the case that's, that's in question. Because remember, enforcement, they don't have enforcement power. So cooperation and goodwill of others, as well as the other parts of government um, at the local level all the way up to the president, can be very helpful for them to make sure that their authority is there. And they have to have public support. Now, social forces, societal changes, the attitudes that are going on, the practices that are going on, they can change or have an effect on the decisions of the Supreme Court. And generally, the decisions of the court themselves actually can reflect these changes in society if the movement is strong enough. Okay, And we're seeing that going on now, whether it's the stuff with George Floyd or if you go back to the 1960s. Typically, we're talking about civil rights stuff here because remember, the civil rights, uh, civil liberties and civil rights are most of the cases that the Supreme Court deals with. All right, so now let's get into some of the, some of the cases um, that the Supreme Court that have had been influential decisions. Now, we've already talked about a lot of these. So talking about Plessy versus Ferguson and, and Brown versus the Board of Education isn't anything new. So you guys should already know this. But just to go over it again, remember, Plessy versus Ferguson was a Louisiana law that stated people could be in separate facilities, in particular, in this case, uh, on uh, railway cars, but as long as they were equal. And Homer Plessy, who was, you know, the the plaintiff in this case appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said no, they upheld the Louisiana law, which basically established that you could have separate facilities as long as they're equal. We know that they those facilities weren't equal. But as the nation changed, in particular after World War II and into the 50s, you're seeing relate race relationships change in a changing atmosphere, rising number of civil rights groups, the war itself changed a lot of um, the actions in, in positions of people in society, whether it's were blacks that were fighting in World War II or working in factories or other, um, <coughs> excuse me, other uh, minority groups, that changes in the atmosphere. So by the mid-50s, you see in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court rules that, se that Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, was unconstitutional because it violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Um, and they used it saying, look, this is a constitutional issue and it's in violation. But this is a change. This this is an example of how the social changes of not only the country, but the justices themselves can overturn previous rulings. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the balancing of power of our Supreme Court. One of the things that helps balance the power of the Supreme Court is the president's influence. Remember, the par power to appoint justices is given to the president with consent from the Senate. Now, when a president has more, has the ability to appoint more justices, that generally brings the court closer to them because they're appointing somebody that more than likely is going to follow what they might want to have done or, or have the same positions. We've actually only had one president in our history that actually has never appointed a Supreme Court justice, and that was Jimmy Carter. Um, everybody else has appointed at least one. Um, and then with that, the president can help the court enforce those decisions. Remember, using remember that the courts don't have enforcement power. So when the president works well with them and has is closer to them, they're more than likely going to use the federal government, the executive departments and agencies to help enforce those decisions of the court. And then that kind of trickles down to the states and local governments as well. Now, from a Congress standpoint, Congress um, can limit the court's ability to hear certain cases because they have 
the power to actually establish their own courts. Um, they can pass laws or introduce bills to limit the court's options, which can happen. It doesn't happen a ton. Um, they can actually reenact a law in a different form or tack it onto another bill if it's rejected. Kind of one of the main issues that tacking stuff on that's, that can be a problem that slows down our legislative branch. They can propose amendments because amendments can kind of circumnavigate that because they go into the Constitution. They can set the justices' pay. They can set the number of justices. So we have nine right now, but they can actually raise that number or even lower it. And then remember, po confirmation power is a big part of it as well. All right, guys, that's all I really have for you in this lecture, just in terms of what are the influencing parts and decisions. There's a few uh, um, links here if you guys want to take a look at them. Um, the CNN video is just kind of showing you what the inside, the actual inside of the Supreme Court little tour. Um, there's a crash course on the Supreme Court if you want a little bit more information. And then there's some um, overviews of the two cases we looked at, Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education. All right, guys, I hope you learned a lot, not only in this lecture, but in this unit. And have a good one.